Hello and welcome to part two of this discussion on principles of disease and the spread of disease within populations. This is part two of a three-part series. So let's get started. So we'll look at these terms here, incidence and prevalence. Uh, there's some confusion about those, but if you look at it, it's 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 pretty easy to see the difference between them. Incidence is a fraction of a population that contracts a disease during a specific time period, whether it's during that week even a day or a month or, or whatever it's just a specific time period how many people get that disease prevalence is the fraction of a population having a specific disease at a given time so how many people actually have it at that particular time so for example the global incidence of AIDS in 2019 was 1.7 million so in the year 2019 1.7 million people contracted AIDS in 2019, the prevalence, or the number of people who already had been diagnosed with AIDS, was 38 million. So that's the difference there. How many people get it in a particular time period is the incidence, while the prevalence, how prevalent is it? How present is it in a population? 38 million people in 2019 actually had AIDS. 1.7 million more were added to it in that year as a result of new infections. A sporadic disease is one that occurs occasionally in the population. Typhoid fever, sporadic, currently uh, pertussis or whooping cough, and perhaps measles. So these are ones that are making a comeback. They're, it's, it's occurring again. The numbers are starting to go up, and so we can say this is a sporadic disease, and let's hope it goes back down again. Um, so, But anyway, currently pertussis and measles, not sure why. Could be because of the... Um, anti-vax but it's hard to say anti-vax gets attacked quite a bit um, but if people aren't getting vaccinations for these particular uh, diseases then it's just a matter of time that they will begin to increase and increase because they're coming in from other populations and now we have a vulnerable population in the United States of people who can contract these diseases whereas we had been getting vaccinations for these diseases for decades and decades and people were, were, were getting them regularly um, and uh, the number, the, the incidence of these diseases was just plummeting year after year uh, till it was about zero in the case of measles but now we're seeing a little bit of uptick and uh, so epidemiologists are looking into this figuring out what's going on why are there upticks in, in these two diseases in particular so those are sporadic ones. They come on the scene, uh, then they go away, then they come on the scene again later. An endemic disease is one that is endemic or always present in a population. Like the common cold, it's an endemic disease. We're always going to have it. There's too many causative agents for the common cold. There's too many ways that it's spread. We don't even quite understand fully how it's spread um, from one person to another. There's been tons of research done on the common cold, and researchers and scientists basically said, look, it's here to stay. It's present in the human species population, and it's going to be forever, I guess, <laughs> for at least the foreseeable long future. Epidemic disease acquired by many hosts in a given area in a short time. So there are epidemics that pop up all around the globe every year from in influenza. Uh, Ebola, for example, it's, it, uh, there's an outbreak of Ebola happening now, even as a matter of fact. And they're very concerned about this in Africa, about Ebola coming up again. And so it's, it's constantly being monitored so that the epidemic levels do not reach the next one, the pandemic level. <clears throat> so with all three of these words, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic, notice they all end in their suffixes demic, which comes from the word that, meaning people. Uh, that's where we get the word like democracy, rule by the people. Demic means people or person, and then n means within. So endemic is within a population. Epi means that it's surrounding, and pan means it's all-encompassing, all around. So that's why we call it pandemic. It's, it's everywhere. It's a worldwide epidemic. AIDS is a pandemic. Right now, COVID-19 is a pandemic. It's in hundreds of countries globally. COVID-19 started out as an epidemic disease. Many people got it in a very short period of time, but because of its contagious nature, it spread around the world in a matter of months. And that was... That is unheard of. Well, I shouldn't say it's unheard of, but it is extremely rare for a disease to spread that rapidly. I mean, we didn't even know about it. And then all of a sudden, from December until 
what in middle of March we just shut down it was around the globe quickly it was very rapidly it spread like wildfire um, and became a pandemic very very quickly um, this my college students you can click on this link if you're looking at the PowerPoint it's a really good TED Ed video it's my favorite TED Ed on how pandemics spread um, it's really cool it, it talks about uh, the plague um, how it became a pandemic at least in the in the known world at that time um, and the Spanish flu the flu of 1918-1919 the flu that killed at least 50 million people globally that was an incredibly devastating pandemic right on the heels of World War I um, terrible time for the world um, but a good video on that herd immunity immunity in most of a population so measles in the United States thanks to the measles vaccination it led to herd immunity where we just don't get it anymore thanks to the to the vaccine um, and we're hoping the same for COVID I think COVID is going to become ubiquitous you know it's hard to say are we all going to have it in some form um, not necessarily disease because many people are asymptomatic but is it going to be like for example the Epstein-Barr virus which 90 percent of the human population has Epstein-Barr um, you know, we just don't show symptoms of, of any kind of illness or sickness. It's just now part of us. Will, will SARS-CoV-2 be like that? It's, it's hard to say. Um, but keep our fingers crossed and hope for a vaccine soon. Acute disease, they develop rapidly of short duration, like influenza is an acute disease. It comes on very rapidly. Chronic, slowly, long duration, maybe less severe, but could also be severe as well. Um, so they're acute and chronic. Subacute, it's not typically, that's not a very commonly used term. Symptoms between acute and chronic. So these ones that kind of fall in the middle, and there aren't many diseases that fall into that category. A latent disease, we talked about this with viruses, latent viral infections like shingles, for example, um, possesses a period of no symptoms when the agent is inactive. And then later it does become active due to one reason or another. Sometimes it's just sporadic, there's no explanation. It just becomes reactivated again. So you had chickenpox. The chickenpox viruses then remain latent in dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord. And then they become reactivated later in life and they show up in this disease that we call shingles. A local infection, they're limited to a small area of the body, like boils and abscesses, just localized infections, for example, where you, where you just have something that swells up and have, maybe has some pus with it as well. Systemic throughout the body or throughout an entire system, that's why it's systemic. Spread via the blood and or the lymph as well, so usually it's both of them spreading through the, the circulatory and the lymphatic system. Measles would be a systemic one. Um, it, you, can, you can actually see it. It, it uh, manifests itself on the skin and presents there, and you can see it with, those, with that macular rash that forms all over the body. A focal infection. <clears throat> is a systemic infection that began as a local infection so it started out like with tetanus as just a puncture wound and it became a systemic infection over a period of time rabies would be a focal infection it starts out from a bite from an animal and then spreads to the entire body and becomes systemic bacteremia bacteria in the blood and septicemia systemic infection arising from pathogens typically bacteria in the blood um, and so bacteremia is is not something to worry about but when you become septic or develop septicemia now it's a problem because it's a systemic infection it's now spreading through the body through the circulatory system toxemia toxins in the blood that's typically why if, if you have septicemia we could probably say it's toxemia because the bacteria are producing toxins and they're being circulated in the blood and that's what's causing the the vomiting or the diarrhea or the hemorrhaging or whatever Viremia would be viruses in the blood, so they're traveling through the, the circulation. Primary infection, that is the acute infection that caused the initial illness, but then you can develop a secondary infection because the immune system has been weakened, and so now pathogens take the opportunity to create this infection. So the primary infection has worn you down. 
and now you develop a secondary infection. Like for example, if you have AIDS being the primary infection, tuberculosis then follows as a secondary infection. It's an opportunistic infection because the body's defenses are obviously weakened. Subclinical disease or what's called an inapparent. It's, it's not an apparent infection. You're infected, but it's not seen. No noticeable signs or symptoms of polio or hep A. Um, these ones uh, can be can be dangerous ones. Typhoid is one as well, where you will excrete, like with polio virus, you excrete the virus in your feces, but you're not showing any signs or symptoms. Or with typhoid, the bacteria reside in the in the gallbladder, and then they get excreted in the feces as well. You feel fine, but you're spreading the pathogen into the environment and giving it to others. That's a subclinical or an inapparent infection. Some predisposing factors to disease. Gender, for example, more UTIs in females than in males, and that's because of, of the differences between male and female anatomy um, in that region. It's the, um, the difference with the length of the ureter, for example. That's what causes it's about eight times more. UTIs are eight times more common in females than in males, so gender can play a factor, just using that as an example. Inherited traits such as sickle cell gene, which can lead to other diseases. So inherited traits can cause somebody to be predisposed to getting other, other pathogenic microbiological diseases. Climate and weather, like staying inside during winter, we don't go out, and so maybe this plays a role in increasing the number of infections. Fatigue, constantly tired, chronic depression, those two often go hand in hand. This depresses, and, and we use this term depression, and we think of it psychologically, but this psychological depression can become physiological as well, and that can depress the immune system too. And so then that makes us predisposed to getting disease. Your age, obviously as we get older our immunity wanes and gets weaker. Your lifestyle, what, what type of life do you live? Um, are you around others in a way that you shouldn't be? These are, are things that can, can be a predisposing factor. Chemotherapy, which wipes out a number of immune system cells, so that makes you susceptible to disease and if you know anyone that's ever undergone chemotherapy, you know they can't be around anybody because their immune system is so weak it's been hammered by the chemotherapeutic drugs. And the environment that you live in, so these are all predisposing factors that can make you more susceptible to disease. They don't always do, but it's possible that they, they can. So this is the stages of a disease, and, and I like this graph, and it shows how it kind of progresses along. And my college students, you'll need to know this graph, so be familiar with the terms that are associated with each of the periods that are, are uh, given here in this graph. So you have the incubation period. I'll start on the far left, and you'll notice that during the incubation period, there are no signs or symptoms. So you have the pathogens in you, and they're multiplying and dividing, but they haven't launched their attack yet. They haven't reached the numbers that they need to be at in order to launch an attack to produce their toxins. And so they kind of just multiply and divide very quietly within you. Remember, compared to a bacterial cell, you are like infinitely larger than them. And so a few hundred or even a few thousand of, thousands of these cells inside of you will do nothing. And so their numbers are just quietly but steadily increasing and increasing, but they haven't produced any of the toxins that make, us, that make you ill. Then there's the prodromal period where you have mild signs or symptoms, maybe some aches, some pains, not necessarily a fever yet, if, if, it is a, if, if the pathogen will cause a fever, but you're, you're feeling a bit worn down, say. You're feeling a bit weak. Then the period of illness, most of your signs and symptoms. Now you're going to have fever, you're going to have uh, vomiting or, or whatever it happens to be that this pathogen is, is causing you to do. Whether it's a respiratory thing or it's an intestinal thing, that's where we call the period of illness. Now if you if immune responses fail and medical treatments fail, that's where death is going to occur at the peak. Period of decline then, so now you're getting better. The signs and symptoms are, are subsiding, 
and then you hit the period of convalescence down at the end where you're you know I think I can go to work tomorrow I think I'll be able to go to class tomorrow that's that's what we're talking about with period of convalescence you're feeling better now so you don't feel anything it gets worse and so the graph goes up and then it peaks at the top and then you start feeling better and the graph goes down so the graph is kind of representing what how you feel I guess <laughs> you could say as it gets higher you're feeling worse and as it goes down you're feeling better so just the stages of a disease a reservoir of infection, they're the, they're the continual sources of infection. So for example, a, a reservoir of infection for AIDS or gonorrhea would be us. Carriers may have inapparent infections or latent diseases, and I just think of typhoid Mary. She had an inapparent infection, and uh, <clears throat> she was uh, very resistant to being confined. It's a pretty sad story. There's a good video on YouTube about um, typhoid Mary and what happened to her and a book has been written as well um, about her mistreatment but also at the same time her um, I say resistance and that's putting it mildly to um, the there was a, a particular um, I don't want to say it was a scientist but he was after her trying to confine her to keep her from spreading this infection and she was kind of running away from him but she was eventually caught and, and put into an infirmary uh, and, and stayed there for decades um, but she had an inapparent infection she was a carrier and she was spreading it to the population animal reservoirs uh, diseases would be rabies Lyme disease malaria and some zoonoses may be transmitted to humans, meaning these, these animal-originated diseases can be transmitted. So obviously rabies can. If a rabid animal bites a human, it can be transmitted to a person, and then they can develop rabies. Same with Lyme disease as well. If the tick bites you and transmits the bacteria into your bloodstream, you can develop Lyme and malaria, same thing. So these are all, they're animal infections the animals are the reservoirs but they can be transmitted to us they're normally not in the human population but they can be transmitted to us and there are non-living reservoirs like soil and water that carry um, the bacteria that cause botulism and tetanus and cholera <clears throat> and so these are non-living ones where they are reservoirs for these bacteria and these pathogens to reside in, in the dirt or in the water, and we can consume them, of course, and get those diseases. Now, how are diseases transmitted? Well, there is different methods, direct contact, a person-to-person -person transmission through a hug or a handshake or um, uh, through uh, sexual uh, interactions. That's a direct transmission. Indirect spread by fomites like tissues and towels, bedding, and cups, and so forth. So, just utensils or whatever. These are non-living, um, non-living things that can carry these pathogens and then pass it on to somebody else. So, somebody dries off with a the towel, then you reuse that towel. There their bacteria got transmitted to the towel, then you use it, those bacteria can now be transmitted to you. That's indirect. It wasn't directly transmitted to you. And there's droplet transmission. Transmission via airborne droplets, like coughing and sneezing, laughing, talking. So <clears throat> this is one that we would associate with contagious diseases. Like here, you've got, you've got Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau. He's a Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada. They are not socially distant, by the way. Look how that, I think that's a little bit less than six feet. However, this was all pre-COVID. <clears throat> but anyway, here's where the two of them got together and, and met, and they're awfully close to each other. Yeah, it's, it, it's almost uncomfortably close, I guess. They don't really see eye to eye on things. I mean, they kind of do, you know, physically their eyes are kind of across from each other but you know what I mean um, they're looking very friendly here being very political but they are very close to each other and look at this guy sneezing we sneeze on average about 20,000 droplets in a sneeze and uh, you know people say well sneeze or, or I guess they typically say cough into your elbow sneezing into your elbow wow that, I mean, you're not gonna get this 20,000 droplets I mean look at the spray pattern it's massive and so sneezing becomes a, 
a very effective vehicle for spreading these uh, these typically viruses. Uh, so viral viruses typically cause these respiratory infections that cause us to sneeze like this. And so it's a very effective way for them to be transmitted into the air and then breathed in on these very small airborne aerosol droplets. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's the end of part two of this three-part series. So please stay tuned for part three and thank you for watching.